sniper here. Welcome to the Intuition Podcast, where we go behind the scenes of academia to find out what people really think. My name is Flint. And I'm Lila. And we're your hosts for this summer. Today we're asking, do I belong here? Particularly as it pertains to navigating campus elitism. And by elitism, we're primarily referring to this broad perception that students at upper-end universities like UBC all tend to come from upper-class backgrounds, meaning that they can afford to get through their degrees with minimal financial stress. And one thing that we really want to do in this episode is sort of combat what we believe to be that myth, Uh, because there's actually a large number of students on campus who don't come from upper class backgrounds. It may not be the majority and it may even be, you know, a fairly small minority, but there are a lot of students who feel like they have a hard time fitting in or belonging in that background. It's it's very, very difficult to not be able to interrelate with your friends who don't feel the same sort of financial stressors that you do. It's a really awkward thing to go around and it's actually something uncomfortable to hear if you're not one of those students who does face those stresses. So one thing we want to do in this episode is basically start a dialogue and have a conversation about elitism on campus and how we can better navigate it together and how we can create a community wherein students from all backgrounds are just a support network for each other. We had the pleasure of hosting two UBC students for this episode. Firstly, we will speak with Yelena Georgic, an undergrad in the Faculty of Arts who has faced particular struggles with financing her education. Then we will speak with Lazar Atanaskovic, a recent graduate from the Faculty of Applied Science who has had a significant familial financial support throughout his studies at UBC. Given that our two guests have come from significantly different backgrounds, we hope that between the two, we can establish a generative dialogue regarding the ways we can better navigate such disparities on campus. So I have a pretty personal story when it comes to navigating UBC as sort of an elitist environment. And it goes back to my first year here. Um, I'm a student who has habitually had two or three jobs to pay for not just my rent, but also my tuition and my living expenses. And I just remember uh, there was a short period of time where I didn't really have any place to stay. I couldn't stay with my parents because we had had it out and I'd ran out of insurance on my car, so I couldn't sleep in my car anymore. And so So for a little while, I was actually sleeping in the totem kitchen. And I remember I just had this one night where I was sitting there listening to some other people in the building talk. And they were basically talking about this international student who was a friend of theirs who basically, she needed to work a part-time job to cover her living expenses because the money that she had got to come here didn't didn't actually quite cover all of her tuition and, and food and what have you. And... You know, it was a really powerful story about how she was working her, her butt off to basically get through school. And I just kind of offered a sort of white flag and said, yeah, I, I really feel that. I, I really appreciate that. And they turned to me and they said, don't joke about that. She has to work. And I said, well, I work th- three jobs and I have nowhere to stay and I sleep in this kitchen. And I used to commute six hours a day just to come here. And for me, hearing that just having a part-time job was the pinnacle of destitution was just an eye-opener because I realized that most people on campus didn't go through this kind of despair, this financial despair that I felt on a daily basis. And it's those kind of little sort of, you might call them microaggressions, which most people I don't think really realize happen here. And it's not like... I want to demonize people who don't understand. But I think that really proves that it's important to have a conversation about stuff like this so that one, we can have consciousness raising for people who may not know that this is a situation on campus. And two, we can basically let people like me know what they can do to help better their experience here and get to a position where they're comfortable. And I think this story that you mentioned there, Flynn, is really interesting because I'm pretty sure that you're not the only person who experienced such microaggression on campus. And we are so glad to have uh, Yelena, who is one of your best friends here at UBC, to share with us her financial struggles when she first started out in, in university and also how she navigated the financial troughs of her university life. And this is her story. I started at 17 and I had to work um, several jobs while in school full time. Mm -hmm. Classes varied from like three to five, usually more like four or five classes. And I'm not gonna lie, it was difficult. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I found that a lot of my peers could not relate, Mm -hmm. especially when you first start university. Like later on, Mm -hmm. like most people have like a part-time job or something, Mm -hmm. but they also usually have a lot more support, like Mm -hmm. financially. 
to begin with, uh, I was living at home mm -hmm. in uh, first and second year, mm -hmm. but home was very far away. Right. It took an hour and a half to get here by transit, and like I couldn't obviously afford parking in a car mm -hmm. at the time. Um, but I was still working, like saving up to move out to live closer, right. not on campus, but close by. Mm -hmm. Uh, but even then I was still paying my bills and like I had to obviously get student loans mm -hmm. to pay the tuition, uh, which, uh, you know, a lot of people still do that, but it was just everything on top of the loans that like added the pressure knowing like, okay, like if I don't like make my bills, I'm not going to be able to have a phone. I also couldn't afford a laptop for a long time. Like, mm -hmm. I used a really old one. <laughs> so that was difficult mm -hmm. uh, for the first two years. But then uh, I saved enough money and then in third year I moved out and you know, paying for everything came a lot easier after, like, establishing myself, mm -hmm. I guess. So for me, it was really quite comforting to hear that story from Elena because it's really nice to know that there's someone on campus that I can empathize with who's shared a similar sort of experience navigating the financial throes of university. But Yelena was also kind enough to share with us some of her stories regarding the social dynamic that comes into play when you come from a less steady financial background. And here's what she had to say. I get that a lot, yeah. actually, mm -hmm. um, like regular, like daily, <laughs> daily, <laughs> literally, <laughs> um, because I, I put off so many social mm -hmm. gatherings or interactions or birthdays or whatever, and I have for years. So it does make me feel bad because I feel like I'm neglecting my. Because there is a certain social responsibility to your friends, mm -hmm. or if that's mm -hmm. you know how I feel, and that is ingrained in us. Mm -hmm. I, uh, in order to be like a successful, really successful member of society, we still have to make time for for those interactions. Yeah. Um, and it is important to find time, but prioritizing is everything. You have to, your degree comes first, your mm. work comes first. So when I do, like, even this weekend, like, I, I went out for, like, an hour or two um, to see some friends, and then I had to go to work. They're like, hey, like, whatever, come come out, call in sick. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, <laughs> can't do that. <laughs> so, well, why not? I don't know how, how do I explain this right yeah. like mm -hmm. that is definitely a challenge yeah. and you know what you don't realize it's also a challenge with the workplace because mm -hmm. they're asking mm -hmm. you to come in mm -hmm. like hey can you work more hours like you're a great worker mm -hmm. uh, I need you and it's like I'm so sorry but I can't even sacrifice those hours that I would like to for work mm -hmm. because of my obligations for school so both sides clash it's mm -hmm. not just a clash with like school it's, it's work too yeah. and it does sometimes cost you like money or career advancements depending on what you're doing mm -hmm. so um and even especially during final season like you do take you like you take more time off mm -hmm. but you have to calculate how much time you can take off you can't take off a whole week that's a vacation time yeah. mm -hmm. that's that's your vacation time on finals right mm -hmm. like so it's it's a real juggle. I remember when I was in second year and third year, and I had this one friend who just wanted to hang out with me all the time. <laughs> all the time. So and she lived in Vancouver. And she would be like, same thing, like just call in sick or like take vacation time. And, and then she'd be like, well, why can't you drive out here? You have a car. I'm like, well, I can't afford insurance. And she's like, mm. well, I'll pay for your gas. I'm like, mm. okay, but then then like I owe you. Yeah. And, that's, and that's weird. Like sometimes people don't understand that like, you paying for things doesn't necessarily help. No. It's almost like I'm kind of like indebted. You feel, yeah, yeah. No, it's a real feeling. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. it's it's like a, it's like a, I'm paying for your friendship and that just kind of feels dirty. It just oh, kind yeah. of, you know, demeans the friendship almost. 100%. I've gotten that too, mm -hmm. where it's like, like, don't worry about it. Like, oh, I know like rent, like friends coming up, I'll pay for the meal. It's like, oh, mm -hmm. you don't understand. Like I, the reason I'm doing this is because I want to be able to be independent and afford my own things. Mm -hmm. I don't want you paying for my stuff just to see me. Like, and it, I, I get mm -hmm. that. And I get that to this day still. And it's, it's not a, it's not a pleasant feeling, but like, it's still hard for people to understand. Like, okay, like, if you surprise me with something, that's different. Like, that's like, mm. oh, you were really thoughtful. But, like, when you're trying to, like, negotiate mm. my time, you're still taking away my time because it's mm -hmm. taking away from school. Mm -hmm. Like, I will tell you when I have the time. Don't get mad at me for saying that. Because mm. right now, like, these, these four years or five years or however long it is for your degree are peak. Mm -hmm. They're key. We're establishing ourselves as adults um, financially and academically and you got to respect the grind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> From that story, it is very apparent that Yelena often struggled with relating to some of her friends at UBC. So we asked her if she ever felt as if she did not belong on a campus of people who she could not necessarily relate to. I had a similar experience, not with my um, friends or peers, uh, say, like in a dorm, but in a classroom, actually, mm -hmm. where 
I, I think it was like maybe even second year. Um, essentially, we're in class and I studied political science mm-hmm. and we we're talking stats and, you know, a big focus on these social sciences is, yeah. you know, inequality and, you know, income disparity, whatever. Um, and we were, I remember the prof was, I can't remember why he was talking about it, but he was saying, oh, those people, those poor people, those people on welfare. And he kept referring to um, lower income households, even in, in Vancouver, mm-hmm. um, as those other people, mm-hmm. as if like it was them to blame, like it's their fault. And it's mm-hmm. like, you can't help, you know, being where you're born, where you're born into or the, the reason that you come into it, like. Especially, it, we're, we're largely, we have a lot of immigrants coming into Canada. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, we're multicultural, it's what we're known for. It's where my background comes from, mm-hmm. immigrant family and mm-hmm. all that. So it, it's not necessarily people's fault, right? Yeah. But uh, when you're in a classroom setting as a student and you're referring to these people that we study on the outside mm-hmm. as if they're animals, as if they're, you know, not even human. Like, I remember tearing up in that class. I was, mm-hmm. It was a big oh, class, no. you know, it's not... Like, I didn't cry, yeah. but, like, yeah. I was just, like, I felt so alone and mm-hmm. ostracized in that moment because I realized my peers around me had did not understand what it was like to be on welfare mm-hmm. and, like, have that experience. And, you know, they blamed you for being on it. Mm-hmm. And it was, like, I was shocked, like, in that moment. Well, it also kind of draws a line because it's, like, clearly none of those group would have made it in here. Right, like it's almost, it's almost, yeah, because yeah, because exactly. it, it's those, it's almost like no one in this room belongs to this, no. so I can say those and, and I can was, talk it was about like them. You guys are the elites, like you, like that's mm-hmm. what, and I still get that. Mm-hmm. You know, you're the elites, and I'm like, bro, <laughs> like <Yeah. laughs> elites live like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like it was, it was, yeah, and like even before that, I felt quite distinct, quite different from my peers because of you know my situation, and to this day, I still feel different because mm-hmm. of that. But mm-hmm. I, st- I feel like I've earned my place. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's almost like that. And it, it shouldn't be like that because at the end of the day, we're all students, mm-hmm. right? right? It's not yeah. like, you know, we all just, we're, you know, we come out of the womb with money. Like, it mm-hmm. doesn't work like that. But it was, it took a long time to overcome that barrier in my own mind. To be frank, that was a really, really hard story to hear, especially about a campus that I've come to know and love. Despite the fact that it's good to hear that Yelena feels as though she's finally sort of fit her way into the campus culture. So another conclusion that we raised to kind of build on that is that resources on their own aren't necessarily enough. One thing that we really need to do is start a generative dialogue between people of all different backgrounds. And one of the questions that we really tried to answer quite intently in this conversation is, how can we get people to intermingle more? How can we raise consciousness? And how can we get people to interrelate on levels which go beyond classist and elitist categories in a way which is helpful to people of all backgrounds? That is the question of the day. Really, mm-hmm. Vancouver does struggle with this um, for different reasons. Uh, it's a lot to go into right now, but there is this question that Vancouver is struggling with. How do we increase social capital? How do we mm-hmm. get people out of their comfort zones, whether it be ethnicity or language or class or whatever it is? And it comes from, I think, a social setting. It has to be okay to mingle between mm-hmm. different schools, mm-hmm. between you know, I think maybe if we enforce more programs that allows people to try each other's cultures, cuisine, you know, mm-hmm. mingle more with friends, like get out of your comfort zone. Don't just listen to the same kind of music. Listen, just to listen mm-hmm. to what other people have to say. It doesn't matter if you agree mm-hmm. with it or not. Have If you don't agree with it, have a healthy debate. Mm-hmm. You know, talk, okay, well, this is what I think about a, a controversial issue. Mm-hmm. Let's say uh, the pipelines, you know, mm-hmm. I support it. I don't support it. Why? Mm -hmm. talk about it listen like okay like you think it'll add more jobs but i think it'll take away jobs why blah 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 that's really how you get people to open up and change their views and and understand like different people's backgrounds because they they have these different opinions because they have different backgrounds Mm -hmm. right so you just have to be open to listening is is the is the key so yeah, and that story is really inspiring to me because it's great to hear that someone is able to juggle through so many responsibilities while getting through university. But on top of the struggles that she had to go through, a big part of our conversation was about um, the resources that she was able to use while she was pursuing her undergrad. And we asked her, what are the external resources that she leaned on throughout her time here? I really benefited from having close friends that mm-hmm. I could you know, mm-hmm. talk to or like who would support me when it was when the going gets tough and I, I would say like don't be afraid to reach out to people mm-hmm. when the going gets really tough um, because it's surprising how many people 
will reach out a helping hand mm-hmm. that you wouldn't even expect. Mm-hmm. Or like, even if you know someone in that situation, like a little bit of coffee, a little bit of food goes a long way mm-hmm. in, in the tough times. Mm-hmm. Like I'll give you an example. Mm-hmm. Um, in first year, <laughs> especially I, you know, this carried out throughout university, but in first year, particularly because I live so far and final season was a crazy time. As most people understand. Um, I, I couldn't commute every day and have like an exam every day. Mm. So I would stay on campus and I used to bring a giant bag with uh, blankets and a pillow (laughs) and like just carry that with me and like study, study, study. And then like before the exam, like get a couple hours in a sleep. And sometimes, you know, you'd stay on people's floors Mm -hmm. or like in like Mm -hmm. random people's like beds or bedrooms or couches, Mm -hmm. like, and, but it was those people that, like, it would let you stay in their rooms and, yeah. like, use their showers and whatever, rather than, like, having to stay at the library or, like, wherever else. Mm-hmm. That really made a difference. And finally, we gave Yelena the opportunity to deliver some concluding remarks and to share some advice on any students who may be experiencing the same financial struggles as she is. And here is the touching advice and story that she had to give to us. It has been a difficult journey for my my personal journey, and I know a lot of people share that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I want, I guess, to say that they're not alone, they're not the only ones doing this, and that it is possible to break through those barriers. Yes, it takes blood, sweat, and tears. A lot. Like, no joke. But, you know, it's worth it. It's worth it if you can push through. And, and I like to emphasize that I was rushing, like, to get everything done, mm-hmm. to, to get you know, my degree, trying to get my degree done and to get as much money as I can in as little time as I could. And I'd like to emphasize that it doesn't have to be that way. You can take more time on your degree, take Mm -hmm. less courses if you need the money and work more or talk to your work and see what kind of hours work best for you. If they can be flexible, that will work to your advantage. And I'm so grateful for my, you know, employers currently and in the past that have been flexible with my hours and understanding with my my time crunches and professors that have like Mm -hmm. said oh like it's okay that it's late I understand like life's busy that makes all the difference because yeah it's late by an hour or a day but I was able to get it done outside of the circumstances that maybe a lot of people don't share Mm -hmm. right so yeah I, I use use your resources as much as you can and take your time because it's not a race Mm. Like at the end of the day, your health is the most important because I noticed I stopped taking care of myself at one point where I wouldn't eat properly, like no vegetables, none, Mm. like no fruit. I don't know how I survived. (laughs) Um, And my health was really taking a toll and you can build bad habits by doing that. Mm. So priority number one is yourself. That's Mm -hmm. how you can, if you want to help other people in the world, also later you have to take, start with yourself Mm -hmm. and build those habits. And then you can really progress your degree. Big time. I, I like, I, I'd like to say a special shout out to my dad <laughs> for especially like helping whenever he could um, and supporting me, especially in work. If it was really late, there were times like he'd, he'd, you know, help out or pick me up, even if like he didn't live with, like I didn't live with him. Um, yeah, I really appreciate that. So it was really great to hear everything that Elena had to say, and it was actually quite helpful. But we wanted to make sure that this conversation wasn't one-sided. And so we also invited one of my other best friends, Lazar, onto the show, because Lazar comes from a very different background, wherein he had quite a bit of support getting through here at UBC. And this is his story, so just take a listen to it now. Yeah, so I come from a decently well-off family, well-off enough. Um, Both my parents have doctorates, so since high school I've known I've been Mm well-off. I know I've been privileged. I know I've I've had more opportunity than some other people, especially with my parents being as educated as they are. So I've always been pushed in that direction. I have enough money in my family to put me through school and to be comfortable. It's definitely helped me through my program a lot more. I I haven't had to work. Um, The ability of not having to work to put myself through school or have student loans, I've been able to introduce myself into a student team, which was a large part of my degree as well because I met a lot of people and made a lot of cool things and um, performed really well with them. And again, a large experience through that. And that, that is something that definitely would not have been possible if I had to work, just not possible. The interesting thing is in my program, I think I haven't met anyone in my program that's not as well off as me or better. Everyone seems to be very fine. Um, and I meet more people that are actually better off than me than I am in my program in electrical mm-hmm. engineering than I do that are worse, which I think is intriguing. Um, the people that I do know 
um, that are worse off than me, I didn't even meet through school. I met through like Flint, for instance. I met through one of my buddies who um, uh, isn't in school, actually. He's a bartender. And I don't think I, it, the, the way we met is really unlikely if you think about it. And mm-hmm. I wouldn't have met Flint at UBC for sure otherwise. We spent a lot of our time with Lazar discussing how difficult it was for students to relate to one another without actually spending time together. So we asked him, how can we better cultivate empathy between students of disparate financial backgrounds on campus? I think that's an interesting question because yeah. I, don't, I don't think I went out of my way to mm-hmm. meet people based on their social strata, yeah. if you will. Yeah. I met people that were nice to me and that I could talk to and that we just were able to be together and just hang out and do schoolwork together. Or most of the time you meet someone, especially for me, I'm not the most social outgoing person, but I met people through projects that I forced myself to be um, partners with or um, doing homework with them or suffering through the same class. I didn't meet people based on so like social, yeah, social economic standing, um, yeah. which is interesting. So it's hard to answer that question because I don't, mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. don't really, unless it's, you know, there's a homeless person on the street, yeah. there's no way to tell. I don't, I don't think there is any way to tell by just looking at a person, mm-hmm. at least at UBC, that they're financially struggling or they're mm-hmm. from a different social class. It's very difficult, which is also interesting because even when you meet someone, bringing up a topic regarding being financially well off, being privileged, or being in financial struggles, no one wants to talk about it. It's uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Even for me, if someone asks or if someone just tells me you're privileged, I'm kind of caught off guard because I'm like, it's, it's a weird thing to hear. Mm-hmm. Same as hearing from someone that they're struggling in financial debt, especially mm-hmm. if they're friend because you want to help them. Mm-hmm. And even if you're well off and you don't have money, you can't really help them because it's not your money that you do your offering. So. Right. It's hard to do anything about that. You know, there's small things you can do, like drive them to school or just hang out with them, buy them coffee here and there. But it's it's really hard otherwise to help someone out that you care about, but is financially struggling. So given that Lazar feels discussions of elitism on campus to be quite uncomfortable, we asked him how he thought that we could better discuss the issue in a way that clearly conveys mutual empathy between students of all backgrounds. Um, regarding um, how you can facilitate people actually wanting to talk about how financially well off they are, how to communicate, how to get help and stuff like that. It's, I think the only way to actually thoroughly get that across is through friendship, Mm -hmm. Um, which is problematic in this sense because it's hard to meet people, especially if it's 80% people that are well off and 20% people that are maybe Mm -hmm. financially struggling at the Mm -hmm. school. Um, It's hard to deliberately meet people that are financially struggling. And then, of course, that being said, is you're not going to just hang out with someone just because they're financially struggling, you know? It's hard to find that bridge of friendship to actually help someone out. So we've had really two meaningful discussions with Yelena and Lazar, and it's a really hard topic to talk about, but I feel we've fleshed out some really important ideas throughout our time with them. And the first point is that financial hardship does not have to break you. And we see that with Yelena's story, whereby she talked about how much the financial stress that she faced during university forced her to seek out help and to network and to build a community that will support her um, throughout her time at UBC. And I really think that's something that for a lot of our listeners out there, if you sort of like have the same struggle, you this opportunity to reflect and to see what can you do ask yourself who can you go to who can you talk to and also another really interesting point about Yellen is that even though she struggled quite a bit and I can relate to this personally as well Mm -hmm. there's something almost freeing about not being indebted to someone and making Mm -hmm. your own decisions for you so like Lazar often talked about how there wasn't a lot that he could do to help because it wasn't his money and it wasn't it wasn't the kind of stuff that he put forward for himself Mm -hmm. he didn't really have autonomy to make decisions and as hard it is as it is to you know kind of take ownership of yourself it really opens up avenues for you to kind of build your own journey mm-hmm. and and not owe anyone anything mm-hmm. and it's almost it's almost freeing even though it's a struggle yeah i think what we really want to emphasize right here is really what you make out of it don't be afraid to like like we said seek out help and to know that from you know despite you have going through such a really stressful time know that you're growing from that stress and from the pain of everything that you have to do And our second takeaway from this episode is that students of different backgrounds can and should be partners rather than competitors. I really appreciated Yelena's story about how a lot of her friends came out to help her when she was experiencing a difficult time. And she really made a good point about how um, you will be surprised to see that a lot of people will help you out when you're in need. And one of the points that I really valued, which Yelena mentioned, was that she encouraged students to take their time when they're going through university. She made a really good point about it not being a competition and, you know, finding out a way how to help another and create a 
much more meaningful、um, experience while you're still in university. And it was really nice for me to have Lazar on the show because he was. Kind of the exemplar for me of interstudent partnerships of students from different backgrounds. Because it was, I was talking about how it could be really helpful just to pick up a coffee or drive someone to work or to school. And he was actually, he actually did that for me every day for two years.、Mm-hmm. He would pick me up from my home and take me to class. And it was always a really big help. Uh, it was always something that I depended on, and it was something that made my life a lot easier. And so there w a s other ways that you know, he, he mentioned that I could help him as well. I could tell him about the world, I could tell him about all the new things I was learning in school. Just because we have different specialties or different things that we rely on or different resources available to us doesn't mean that we can't share them and that we can't make each other's lives better. And I think hearing your story about that, Flynn, just reminds me that sometimes the small actions, like the small thoughts, really can make the biggest changes、um, while we are going through a really stressful time. And I guess that really brings us to our last point, which is it's important to have an open mind when you meet new people. You should not only refrain from prejudging them based off of their nominal characteristics, but you should also make sure to learn their story and try and empathize with them whenever you can. Because all of us got here a different way, and all of us have different strengths and weaknesses and different resources available to us. And it's really important to make sure that you're aware of what. Privileges are granted to you. You're aware of what weaknesses you have. You're aware of all those different things, and that you try to be aware of them for others as well. And I know when you hear us say that it's important to have an open mind, that is something that's easier to be said than done. We acknowledge that it's really something that's really hard to put into practice, but it requires a little bit of practice every day.、Mm-hmm. And with a sort of like a constant practice and being mindful of the situation of other、mm-hmm. people, we promise that you'll be much more an empathetic person. Yeah, and I think one of the best ways to do that, that Lazar really touched on, is to build friendships. It's really hard to understand something rather than just kind of passively know it if you don't have a personal connection to it. So, one of the things he was saying is that he, he probably wouldn't even know this was a situation if he hadn't met me by happenstance. He didn't even meet me on campus. He met me by another friend who he, he didn't even mention actually had to drop out of school for finances.、Uh, it's really hard to build friendships and get out of your bubble, especially hard to find. Find people because it's、mm. largely an invisible characteristic that we've been talking about. But when you do, you can really learn a lot about not just others, but about yourself and about society more broadly. We're all incredibly privileged to attend the University of British Columbia. We're all incredibly privileged to live in a country that's as safe and as prosperous as Canada. But If you don't get out of your bubble and really try and empathize with others of different groups, it's really hard to appreciate that privilege. It's really hard to appreciate what kind of circumstance that we get to live in and, and the, the prosperity and the happiness and the joy that we get to experience while we're here. And I think the point that you just raised just reminds me of the idea that sometimes the most valuable thing that you can get out of university is the relationship that you form with the people around here. And I really think that that should just encourage you to sort of like be more. Curious of the experiences that other people have and to learn and to also teach other people of the unique experiences that you have. So, I guess that brings us back to the question of do I belong here? And if you have this question at all, you should just know of course you do. You had to be brilliant to get in here to begin with. And you're amongst many, many peers if you come from a lower financial background. If you face financial hardship, you are not alone. And that doesn't break you. You know, I, I managed to get one of the best jobs on campus here working at the podcast. I managed to graduate. I managed to finish everything. And was it really, really difficult? Of course it was. But Yelena also finished among many, many other people who have gotten out of here.、Mm. And Doing that and going through that process of getting out of here with hardship will make you that much stronger of a person,、mm-hmm. and your story is that much more your own.、Mm-hmm. And so, if you ever, ever, ever question whether or not you belong here, don't. You do. You absolutely do. And I think just to add on to that, if you sort of have the question of belonging,、um, I think just knowing from this, hearing from the story that Lazar、uh, told us, know that there are other people who are also looking out for you and who do care for you. And sometimes it, it might be a bit hard to sort of like notice that, but know that there are supportive people out there. There are people who care for you and that there are people who can support you in many ways. Absolutely. And I know that a lot of this episode has dealt mostly with sort of the social side, the human、mm-hmm. side of what it's like to have financial hardship on campus because we're trying to show that the institution isn't just a bureaucracy of numbers and, and letters.、Mm-hmm. But I will expound a little bit more in a blog that will be linked lo- below on what some of the nitty gritty things that I wish I had known about more of the resource side of struggling financially on campus. And I hope that you get, ha- take the time to check it out if you, if you have any sort of these struggles. And to add to that, if any of the points 
comments that we made today resonate with you, we highly encourage you to share with us your story, whether you were struggling or not, by tweeting at us at UBC Learn. And we also have an Instagram page that is also UBC Learn. And you can also comment on the upcoming blog post that Flynn just mentioned. And with that, we would like to thank you for joining us today and for contributing to the conversation. We'll see you again in the next episode. Thank you. Bye. Not safe for here? Thank you.